Caraca! Good afternoon, Democrats. How you doing? Come on, how you doing? Sorry, it's Dr. Daraka. He's got his PhD. The other day I was reading a report from Oxfam, I'm sure many of you have heard of, a very well-respected international development organization. They released a report that I, I haven't been able to get out of my head since I saw it. It said that the richest 85 people in the world, the richest 85 people in the world control the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world. That's three and a half billion people. 85 people, three and a half billion. Unless you think that that's just something that happens over in poor countries, our country, shamefully, is a leader in that trend. In fact, the United States ranks fourth in income inequality after just Russia, the Ukraine, and Lebanon. That means that the 47% under the margin, the poorest 47% of America, has zero wealth. I didn't make that up. Zero wealth. That means no money in the bank, no equity in a home. That also means, on the flip side, that a single income in our top bracket, one income of the richest Americans, could put every homeless person in this country in a home. We talk a lot as Democrats, as progressives, as liberals, about eradicating poverty, about bringing people up. Well, I want to say something that doesn't get said very often and is probably going to get me in trouble. But God damn it, there's some people who are just too rich. Now the good news, the good news is that history is extremely clear, crystal clear, that this level of inequality can be pushed back. That we can make progress and live in a more just society. And history is so clear that it has given us a very, very obvious path to get there. We know exactly what builds an equal society and an equal economy. And it is working men and women sticking together and organizing to bargain collectively with their employers. And it has to be followed up with a government that has their backs. And that doesn't just mean giving speeches or going to a labor meeting every two years to go and try to get a, a campaign contribution. It doesn't even mean just ensuring that workers have the, the uh, objective right, the theoretical right to form a union. It means changing the law to even the playing field to make it easier for workers to organize. It means signing every bill that comes to your desk that expands collective bargaining rights. It means changing the tax code to reward work, to reward investment, and to punish squirreling money away overseas. I have trouble, I, I have to confess, that I have trouble articulating myself about economic inequality. I have trouble talking about it because it's so hard not to get choked up in thinking that you could fill a double-decker bus with people who control the same amount of wealth as three and a half billion people. And how did we get this far? We didn't get this far down this road by losing a single election or a single ballot measure or even a few elections. And we have to be honest and we have to say that Democrats bear responsibility for this reality. We talk a lot about the 1990s, the boom, boom, go, go 1990s. 
where our policies absolutely did grow the economy and create an incredible amount of wealth. But it was in the, United, in the 1990s when wages were stagnating. It was in the 1990s when our party shamefully began its love affair with garbage so-called free trade agreements. So it has to be in this decade and it has to be in this generation that we begin the long march to reclaim our republic, to reclaim our decency, to reclaim equality as a value. Conservatives want to talk about economic inequality only in terms of so-called opportunity. They want to do that because they don't want to talk about wealth and they don't want to talk about power and they don't want to talk about class. They want to talk about those things without really talking about them so they just say, I'm for opportunity, opportunity. But if you read between the lines, actually you don't really have to do that. It's pretty obvious. When they talk about, about, about opportunity, what they mean is that they want everyone in this room, white and black, Latino, API, gay, straight, in between, whoever, everyone should have the opportunity to work at a Walmart. Every student should have an opportunity to go into Hawk for half or all of their life in order to get an education. Every boss should have an opportunity to fire you if you come to them and ask for more. That's the kind of opportunity society that conservatives are coming at, at us with. And we have to respond by being brave enough to talk again about equality in its own right. Because so many of the issues that we care about are really us talking about equality without talking about equality. When we fret over our education system and we talk about so-called failed schools, what are we talking about? We're talking about schools in which parents are working four jobs between them and can barely afford to send their kids to school with shoes. And then somehow we think if we test the hell out of the teacher that the teacher's gonna teach away economic inequality. It's even about our politics. It's about our day-to-day -day organizing. Everybody here has walked precincts and everybody here has sat down in a strategic meeting to talk about getting out the vote. And everybody here knows that our base doesn't get out and vote as aggressively as the Republican base does. And we may not want to talk about it because we want to be euphemistic and we don't want to offend anybody. But the reason for that is that our base is in that 47% that doesn't have any wealth. And when you don't have any wealth, it's a struggle to, to, to mobilize the hope to think that your voice can even matter. We are organizing against economic inequality when we are trying to get out the vote. We are organizing against economic inequality when we're trying to save schools. So we need to start talking about economic inequality with every single breath that we have. It took, it took 60 years to, to almost decimate the New Deal. It took 30 years for them to undermine the war on poverty and the great society. It's going to take decades. It's going to take decades for us to make back what we've lost. There's no way around that. We have so much work to do to reconvince people that their own organizations of workers aren't their enemy. To reconvince people that government is not the enemy to reconvince people that change can happen. That's going to take years. I'm so grateful that my president gets the question of economic inequality. I am so grateful that my legislative leaders in Sacramento get the question of economic inequality. But here's the thing about politicians, and I love them all. They're easily distracted, And if someone really smart with some numbers shows them that maybe economic inequality, since Occupy is sort of not in the news anymore, maybe economic inequality isn't top in the polls, they'll want to go and start talking about something else. Our job has to be to bring the conversation right back to economic inequality.
I couldn't agree more with the speakers who have said that climate change, climate change is the challenge of our generation. And if we don't confront climate change, we will lose our planet. Brothers and sisters, I just want you to know, and I want you to believe, and I want you to feel that the question of economic equality is just as important that if we don't solve climate change, we will lose our planet. If we don't solve the question of economic inequality, we will lose our souls and we will lose our republic. Thank you.